Today we are going to look at Ali Imran, which is chapter 3, verse 95. Certainly the first house appointed for men is the one at Bakka, blessed and a guidance for nations. In the Holy Quran, in this place, the word used is Bakka. And uh, there are two reasons given for this. The first is that uh, this is how the Old Testament refers to this area. And the second reason is that Kaaba is actually the inside cuboid and the area that, that is around it. Uh, when it, that is included, that is sometimes referred to as uh, Bakka. But that is not the purpose of my talk. The purpose of my talk is to show you that when you pray to God with a true and sincere heart, And you have this feeling that you want to achieve something. Then, even though on the face of it, you do not have worldly resources, how you can be successful? Because you see, sometimes people say to me, there's only a few of you. But the question is not of numbers. The question is whether you are on the right path. Many years ago, a hundred years ago, two men got off, a, got off a train at Woking railway station because they had had news from India that there is a mosque there which is derelict and which is in need of being populated. As they say in Urdu, Jo abad honi chai. I don't know what they felt as they got off that train and turned left down Oriental Road and walked to that mosque. what their feelings were when in the heart of Christendom they saw those minarets and that door. Remember, before they arrived in this country, the Muslims who were here didn't even, didn't say not just their Friday prayers, but wouldn't even say their Eid prayers. This surprises you today? I'm a witness not to those events, but I'm a witness to the fact that in early 1960s when we came to, uh, to the United Kingdom and the first Ramzan came, there were only about five Muslim families. We approached all the families and asked them what preparation, what arrangements were we going to make for Eid. And you know what our friends did? They laughed at, they laughed at us. They actually laughed at us. And their words were, you're in England now. And you're going to say your Eid prayers? We lived in a place called Southampton at the time. And we said, yes, of course we're going to say our Eid prayers. If none of you join us, just our family will say our Eid prayers. And upon that, the landlord of the house where we lived, he vacated a room and we put sheets down and of course, no one knew 
how to say he prays. So my father told them and he led the prayers and uh, so on and so forth. So this is in early 1960s. Can you imagine what the situation was when this man, Hazrat Khwaja Kamaluddin, Rahmatullah stepped off the boat and landed in, in England? How impressed Muslims were by the British rule all over the, the world. Their science and their learning and their technology and their inventions. Muslims themselves regarded Islam as a backward religion. A religion that could not stand and defend against itself, uh, uh, defend itself against the mighty onslaughts, not only of Christian missionaries, but also of philosophers and scientists. And yet this man, he not only started Friday prayers, he not only started Eid prayers, he said, I will set up base camp here and I will teach you what the right moral and social and spiritual values are. In the heart, in the capital of that empire on which the sun never set. He wasn't afraid. It is this, this fear what will people say? It doesn't matter whether you're a Muslim in a predominantly Christian college or school or country or an Ahudi in a predominantly non Ahudi Muslim area. The fear is the same. What will people say? What will they do? And as he said his first prayer, and maybe it was the first azan that was called out in that mosque, or maybe the first azan for many years that was called out. And he took his turban off and he cleaned a little area to make it free of dirt and dust and bird droppings and whatever else. And after the praise, he opened the Quran and the Quran fell open at this verse of the Holy Quran. And Hazrat Khwaja Kabaluddin Sahib fell down upon his face and he cried and he lamented and he said, Oh God, I take this verse as an omen that just like you made Makkah the center of propagation of unity of Godhead, may this mosque invoking become the same. And that prayer was answered. What means, what resources did he have? Did he have money? Did he have men? Did he have literature? Did he have secretaries to type things for him? He had nothing. He had nothing. And he said, I am going to propagate Islam in England. His Messiah had said to him, I've seen that I'm delivering a lecture from a pulpit in London and I catch many white birds. And he wanted that that prophecy should come true. Without resources, we say we don't have money. 
We say we don't have this. What did he have? Which madrasa had he gone to? Where had he learned Arabic? And where had he learned logic? And where had he learned hadith? That we are told all these things are essential before you can propagate Islam. You don't need anything. You need this to be in the right place. You need your heart to be in the right place. Just like Hazrat Khwaja Kamaluddin Sahib's heart was in the right place. Why is it that there are people with resources, kings and prime ministers, with money and with secretaries and with computers and with servers and with huge mosques? And yet, they cannot propagate Islam and they cannot bring people close to Islam. New mosques are being built every week, every month. Beautiful mosques. Go to Faisal Masjid in Islamabad. <clears throat> Better still, go to Sheikh Zayd Mosque in Abu Dhabi. One chandelier in that mosque cost eight million dollars. I think most of you must have seen that mosque. And there's, I think, four of them. Thirty-two million dollars just for chandeliers. And what did my Messiah have? And what did <coughs> my prophet have? You all remember that tale. I think it was when Muslims uh, were fighting some country. Perhaps it was Persia or Byzantine, I can't remember which one. And they were invited by the king to come and have an audience. And to impress Muslims, he put out his best carpets and best furniture and everyone dressed up in their finery and silks and so on. And Muslims went there. How? Did they also dress up in the same way? They rode into that camp on their horses. They got off those horses and they were dusty, and they were dirty, and their clothes were old, and their clothes, clothes had patches on them. The servant who showed them in was better dressed than these people. And the king looked at them, and he laughed. And it was the same, and he had a mighty army. And there were a handful of them. He had treasuries full of jewels and gold and money. And all they had was the clothes that they stood in or the little food they carried in a, in a bag on their waist. And they overturned the kingdom of that king. And swept through his kingdom to many other countries. Why? They didn't have any resources. Why? Because the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu had inspired this faith in their heart. And because they were inspired, they weren't overrode. They weren't impressed by worldly resources and means and horses and, and, and uh, jewelry and gold and silks and so on. What resources did Hazrat Masih Maud al-Islam have? What money did he have? Eventually people went to him and contributed, but when he started, what did he have? Nothing. 
even at that time he was writing to newspapers in Chicago in London he was the master of how to put your message across to the modern man. Things have changed slightly, but the principle has remained the same. There's no point in me standing here and giving this message to a few of us here. Jawad knows what I'm going to say. Nasir Sahib knows what I'm going to say. Everyone else who is sitting here knows what I'm going to say. So what is the point of my preaching to the converted? <clears throat> this message should be out there, in the streets. It should be shouted from the pulpits of churches, from the towers of temples and gurdwaras. We don't have to be aggressive, we don't have to attack them, we don't have to be abusive and so on. And this was what Hazrat Khawaja Kamaluddin did. There was a little tract written by Maulana Aftaguddi based on a lecture that he gave in a church. Position of woman in Islam. Read that. If you don't do anything else, just read that one. It will show you the confidence, the confidence about the truth of Islam that was instilled in these people's hearts by the Nusim of the last. You see, today it's easy. In many ways, today is easy. These days it's easy. British no, no longer rule the world. There is more freedom. Muslims suffer less from inferiority complex compared to those days. But in those days to go into a church and stand in front of those people and tell them what social problems their society was causing because of the way it was behaving and living. And here is another moral code, here is another social code that is going to eliminate that, those problems. That has some meaning. But it all comes back to what is in your heart. All the rulers come and go. <clears throat> I keep on saying to you, go to Hamayo's tomb in, in, in Delhi and as you step up to the platform where the tomb is, outside the enclosure, there are people buried there and the wind and the sun and the rain has even washed away their names from their gravestones. Even their names have been washed away. They're buried in the emperor's mausoleum. You think, can you imagine what sort of people they were in their time? Princes, before whom they <coughs> trembled. <coughs> but we remember Gamaluddin. Is it because of the money he had? Is it because of the houses he left behind? Why do we remember? Because although he was one man, helpless, without means, he had this confidence that he has the truth with him and he has God with him. And that is why he succeeded. If we too have this confidence in our hearts, we too shall succeed. But it's a question of really 
unquestioning obedience to Hazrat Masih Salam, that you go and present Islam and say this is what the Messiah of the age told us to do and this is the picture of Islam. Unless and until we do that, everything else is theory. <laughs>